Thank you. And it's delightful to be here. Uh, I, I want to talk about some of the uh, latest progress that we're making, and I'd not so like to give you some directions that we're moving forward, whether they're right or not, I don't know. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about is just the, that we have a scientific advisory board. The, uh, this is our uh, MECFS project. It's supported by the Open Medicine Foundation. Everything I'm going to show you has been supported by the Open Medicine Foundation. And we've had several um, of our advisors uh, are here. Uh, in fact, you just heard uh, Maureen Hansen. Uh, Jonas is one of our advisors. Uh, Mula and uh, Fug are, are on our advisory board. And also, uh, we have two people here, Ron Tompkins and Wen Zong Zhao, uh, who we just uh, awarded a new uh, Cooperative Center grant award to, to start in a collaboration. So we're trying to expand our efforts. <coughs> uh, they will be focusing a bit more on some of the clinical aspects that we need to do, uh, since I'm not a physician. I just talked about that. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things that was very clear for some time um, is that we need an assay. Um, uh, and, and so many patients, uh, including my son, were told that there was nothing wrong with them because the doctor carried out a bunch of tests and they all come back normal. Um, and incidentally, he is now severe, he's bed bound, he uh, can't talk, uh, he can't read, and uh, uh, he, he's a very severe patient. Uh, I still take blood samples from him and we run those same tests that the doctors do. Uh, he's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with him. Um, th those tests are lousy for this test and that's the problem. Um, and they often say it's in your head or depression and it, we, we need something to say that that's not true. So our focus right now is to say uh, that they're not healthy. And all we're comparing them to are healthy controls. And can we see a clear difference? That's pass number one. The next thing to figure out is how, what do we need to distinguish it from in terms of another disease? Often very difficult to get a biomarker that distinguishes it from all other diseases. For one thing, you have to do all other diseases. <laughs> And I'm not sure that it's necessary. What we need to do is work with the physicians to know what do you need to know in a diagnostic test of this type? Or can you diagnose it from other criteria just like talking to the patient? So that first pass is to compare it to healthy. Uh, we've done a, some, a standard um, uh, instrument called the Seahorse. Uh, a number of people and scientists at this meeting have used that instrument. And this just shows you an example. And what we've done, what gives us the best result is using uh, isolated T cells from patients and then stimulating those T cells, and then measuring their energy production. I don't want to go through the details of how this test all works. Uh, I just want to show you this difference here. And that's been pretty reproducible between the healthy controls and MECFS patients. Um, if we don't use the stimulation on T cells, uh, it's more variable. And it's also de dependent on when they've last eaten. And that's a really difficult thing to have the patients define uh, they, have to, they can't eat before they come in. So this is something that we're looking at as a possibility uh, as a test because it's commercially available. The instrument costs about $100,000, so, $100, so I don't particularly like it. Um, and this just shows our, our results from this in terms of, the, uh, of compare the, comparing the differences. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, in the pilot project. Uh, another device that we've developed and we've worked with extensively, uh, we've referred to it as a nano needle, and it's called a nano needle because of the fabrication of it. Uh, the, 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 it's um, a needle that's nano fabricated. We do it at Sanford. Uh, it, it has two electrodes in it, two, two gold electrodes that uh, uh, conduct electricity, and they're very tiny. Uh, they're 50 nanometers. Um, that's a very small distance. <laughs> and, uh, and they're separated by uh, an insulator 
and, uh, <clears throat> and then it's, it's quite long. And these, these needles stick into a little micro trough here. Uh, and we have uh, uh, 2,500 of these uh, in, a, in a centimeter. And so with these devices, then we, we, we measure the, what's called the electrical impedance. Uh, I'm not going to give you the formula for electric impedance, uh, it, but it's something engineers use a lot. It's a very sensitive uh, electrical measurement. And uh, we, we make uh, 400 measurements per second. So when we get done doing an experiment, we'll have, made, we'll have taken about uh, 1 billion measurements. That's much, much more useful than some medical devices that measure, make one measurement because you don't really know what the variance is when you look at that. So we worked out all the parameters for doing this that give us the best results. Now it is nanofabricated, that's a problem because most labs don't have a nanofabrication facility, but these can be made commercially. And, and if we make them in large number commercially, they won't be very expensive. Uh, we probably can make them for a dollar to maybe five dollars. We've also figured out how to clean them so we don't have to remake them, make new ones. So here's, a, here's what it looks like for almost all measurements. Uh, uh, when we put a healthy sample in, it's very flat. If we put in a, and this is blood, so we just take blood, remove the red cells, and it's basically one drop of blood that's put on the device. And then uh, if we put on uh, ME-CFS cells, they're the same they, as healthy controls. But what we reasoned is that because the, there is a sort of an energy deficiency, and this is not necessarily correct, <laughs> uh, that if we made the cells work harder, we would see a difference. And so what we do is we add sodium chloride, salt. And cells uh, have to pump salt out of their cell. If salt goes into the cell, it's got to get pumped out. The pump requires energy. So by just simply putting salt, very simple, you make the cells work. And what happens with them when they work is that their impedance increases. The reason we tried this experiment was if we did a, a culture of bacteria and uh, looked at its impedance, and then we add an antibiotic if the antibiotic is going to kill the cell, the cell is still alive, but if it's going to kill the cell, the impedance will change. If the antibiotic does not work, it doesn't change. So it's a very, very fast way to tell what antibiotic to use. And the same thing goes for, tum for tumors. We put an anti-tumor agent in, we can tell very quickly whether the tumor agent is actually going to work on the patient or not. And so we know a physiological change will change the impedance, and that's what we're just looking for. <clears throat> and this has been very reproducible. If we take the same patient and do it a week later, we get virtually an identical result. And it is dependent upon the patient. So this is a very, it's a very cheap to, way to do it. You can get it in real time. So it's not something that you have to wait weeks to get. Um, so it's, the, it's a response to sodium chloride, um, <clears throat> and it might be able to use as a diagnostic tool. Um, and we've also tried it to treat the cells with some drugs. We've tried a few of these now, uh, and, if, and see what happens after the drug treatment. And we have found a number of drugs that in fact seem to get rid of this effect. We don't know if they're going to be useful or not. But it could be used for, dr for, for drug screening, and we'll explore, we are exploring that. Now, um, let me just show you a, 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 a few experiments. So what you show here is patients and healthy controls. So there's a very big difference. And uh, the, if you ask, what is the probability that you could have gotten this uh, by chance? Uh, and, the, and the answer is seven times, uh, it's about one, one, one chance in 10 million. Um, and, and that's actually a, a pretty good uh, in terms of a diagnostic test. Now we have done a few experiments uh, trying to understand what, what, what works in this assay. And, and we call this the plasma swap experiment. So our initial thought is it's in the cell. 
And so we decided, okay, well, let's just test that out. And we do a plasma swap, where we take the plasma from MECFS cells and put it on healthy cells and vice versa. And um, what we find um, is that the signal that we get tracks with the plasma. It's not the cell. And that even suggests the cells are actually pretty healthy. But there's something in the plasma that's causing this effect. We don't know what it is yet. Uh, but that's something that we need to figure out because that, it's going through the entire body. And it may be causing some of the effects. And if, and if we can uh, figure out what it is and what its size is, uh, we might be able to find a way to remove it. And that actually could be a treatment. Now we have another, so I'm just going through a few devices because we, we have to figure out which device we should use. So we have another, this is much earlier, it's a collaboration we've discovered, a uh, professor at the San Jose State uh, was developing this. We were going to develop it on our own and then we realized he was already doing it, so we decided we would collaborate. And it's a microfluidic device that measures uh, deformability of red cells. And uh, the idea of this device is you have a, a larger channel that red cells, just a drop of blood again, goes through and the red cells have to get squished normally when they go through your body. And uh, this particular one uh, channel is, uh, is five microns, which is a little bit larger than a lot of the capillaries. Uh, and then uh, what, what, what happens in, uh, if the cells uh, are not as deformable is that one, they'll get stuck just before going in because they have to deform. And when they deform, they may go slower through this. And then uh, you can also measure how, how much elongation you have. So this is easy to do. You just, you just image it and, and you do about a thousand cells and you average them. So this can be done relatively fast. Um, um, yeah, here we go. Um, and you can see the red cells coming through with this device. Now you can see that this, they're not being squished very much. And so, um, we have to redesign this in instrument these are, and go down to probably uh, uh, three to two or two microns and make it better. <coughs> um, but in fact, we do see a difference on bulk. So on bulk, we're looking at we, a thousand cells on average. They, are, they enter much slower. Um, they have a slower transit velocity and they have less elongation. But right now, that does not work for a diagnostic tool because there's a lot of variance. And there's a lot of differences between different patients and, and controls. So we have to have it so that the patient will always differ from a healthy control. I suspect it will work if we make it a very smaller capillary. Uh, that involves a, a new fabrication of molds and so forth that we have to make, which is in the process. Um, <clears throat> Again, this is a very inexpensive, very simple test. What physiological effect it has because of the lack of deformability, I don't know. This is not a new idea. Uh, it's a little bit of a mystery. We haven't figured it out yet, but people have reported things of this type in the past, and it hasn't really been followed up on. Whether or not it actually changes the, the blood flow in a person isn't clear, uh, but it could be used as a diagnostic uh, we will use a, a, an atomic force microscope to make much, much cleaner measurements about the deformability. That's all set up at Stanford. It's very easy to do. Uh, we also have um, several uh, chemical engineering uh, professors that found this interesting, and we'll also start doing some measurements on red cells and much more detailed, complex measurements. Those could turn out to be a diagnostic as well. Uh, so we ha the, here's the... Uh, uh, another instrument that we have built. And um, it's, it's a, a device that measures uh, uh, magnetic levitation. And uh, what that is is we can, we can uh, suspend something in a magnetic uh, fluid if we put a magnet on it. And it'll create a density rate. And in fact, you can even suspend whole organisms in this device, not this device, because this is a micro device but it allows us to suspend cells very quickly. So you put a blood sample in it and put a magnet field on it, and it will very quickly, uh, the cells will go to a density in the little tube. And the little tube is here. 
And uh, what you can see, and what this was developed for, uh, we always have difficulty getting funding, so you've got to do something that's uh, uh, more fundable. Uh, we often have to do that. So cancer is more fundable. So this was developed to, to separate circulating tumor cells uh, from, white, from the white cells and the red cells. And it does work for that. And that helped fund the development of this instrument. Um, and here you have some imaging of, of, of staining of the, uh, the red cells, the white cells, and the tumor cells. Oh, not this one. The tumor cells are above this one, excuse me. And we can, in fact, separate lots of different cell types as well with the device. And we've also then converted that into a preparative instrument where you separate the cells and they will, they will separate by density. Here the circulating tumor cells are. And then uh, we have little uh, ports that go out here and collect those cells. Now, one of the things you um, uh, should know about this is the, is the cost. The major cost, in fact, the only cost of the, running the instrument is the capillary. So each of these runs costs five cents. And here's, a, here's a, a longitudinal study just on one patient looking at the variation in density of the white cells. And uh, they, they vary quite a bit in density. There's a, one measurement which showed it was pretty close to the normal. Uh, and uh, that, that's relevant in terms of what happened. And what this measurement was made right after a bacterial infection in the blood. And the significance of that is the patient became much, much better after that. Now, we made a mistake of saying it was, pro oh, we put him on an antibiotic. So the antibiotic made the patient better. And the answer is no. Because <laughs> um, uh, it was the fever, the bacterial infection made the patient better. And there's other reports of that. Now, some people said it's the fever. I think it's the bacterial infection that made them better. Um, and we've seen a couple of examples of that. But in general, uh, the cells are light. And the only problem would be this, but this would not be a diagnostic problem because this person uh, was on antibiotics and would not be, you would not try to diagnose them under those circumstances. Um, uh, we are going to we plan to use the, what goes on in a, in a bacterial infection that makes them better. And, and we're going to try to use that as, a, a, as a, a way to try to understand what's going on. I think people have already mentioned you want to look at when people are, what happens to them when they get better. Uh, one way to look at that is what happens in a bacterial infection. And this is just a, the device. So uh, and we're, we're, a lot of people are doing this. Uh, to try to decrease cost of, of instrumentation. And so here's the instrument, it's here, and we're simply using the camera from an iPhone, and then the, and the phone is used as the computer for doing everything. So uh, 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 one of these smartphones is like the cheapest computer you can get, it makes it handheld. Uh, and so you, you can make this whole instrument for under $1,000. And it's portable. So uh, I've just shown you a few examples of devices that we're trying to do. And now we're going to hold what, is, is, at least in the US, is called a bake-off. And, um, and it's done exactly like a bake-off. <laughs> so we'll take a, a, the next blood samples that are now coming in. We run them on all instruments. And we run them uh, with what Bob Navio did. Uh, with the metabolomics, and he found a signature that, that diagnosed the disease. So we can compare it to that. So that will give us five different instruments to look at the consistency. Now, one reason you do this is the fact that you might find that there are some exceptions, that it doesn't work right. But the other diagnostic tool did work right, because it's measuring something different. So in fact, you might have to use two different instruments and get much, much better results. So we're looking for, we, we, really, we really don't want a lot of false, positive, false negatives. False positives are not such a problem. <coughs> uh, and I, what, what, the way I showed you this uh, is that we have one instrument that can physically separate cells, 
One instrument uses red cells, the other instrument uses white cells. So in fact, we can combine all three instruments into one. And they all could use the same computer, I think, and, 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 and probably the camera. And so that we, we could actually make all different measurements on the same device um, because they use different cell types. That's a possibility. And that allow us to get more information in a better test. The next thing to do is to look at other diseases that are closely related and how it performs. Now, and that's the one that we have to talk to physicians about because it's really possible that other diseases will show the same behavior. Now we can always do something else like another biomarker to try to separate and resolve those. But our biggest goal is to show that the patients are, are, are clearly not healthy and there's something wrong with them. Now I'd just like to turn to another uh, uh, bigger project that we have going on. Uh, this is all funded by the Open Medicine Foundation. Uh, it cost about two million dollars. And uh, it was to look at severe patients. Now the, uh, what we really wanted to look at are bed-bound patients because people don't normally study them because they don't come to clinics. And, it, and sometimes you'll hear severe patients in studies. Those were the severest patients that came to the clinic. They're not necessarily severe patients that we would. So we should probably call these very severe patients or something uh, because uh, uh, most of these are bed bound or at least house bound. Uh, and then um, in addition to that, a new, they were doing a new study of families. Uh, that's not done yet. I don't have data to show you. Um, and that's looking at families where there's more than one affected. And that is not uncommon, unfortunately. And it's really horrible because uh, uh, the, uh, one family having multiple affected is really hard. Uh, and one reason for looking at these is that it, there's a reasonable chance that what's going on in those families is something genetic. And that will help us to get a, the genetic basis maybe of the disease. So most people think that how you do research is you create a hypothesis. And then you devise a test to rule out, uh, to try to rule out that hypothesis. That's actually wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, Vicky's not here anymore, so I can say it. NAH has got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is not the scientific method. But that's, what's, that's what NAH requires if you write a proposal. And that is incorrect. The, the scientific method is observation hypothesis. Because if you don't have observations, then you generate a random hypothesis based on nothing. And we'll never get there. So what you want is observation. And that observation creates an idea. And that's the hypothesis. You're testing it based on something you've observed. And that's how all science has been done. Why they say that is that when you do a grant, and you test a hypothesis, inevitably you'll make new observations. And that's the basis for your next experiment. And that can keep going on and on and on. What happens when you start a new disease where you know that almost nothing about at the molecular level? You have to make observations. And then you can generate hypothesis. And in fact, you heard uh, Nath's talk. That's what he's doing. <laughs> He's making lots and lots of observations. There's no hypothesis there. So, uh, so the idea is to try to create as much data as we can. That's something we're very good at doing. I've done this for years. Uh, and so I'm just going to show you a few lists. You don't have to look through them. But these are the kinds of tests that we're going, we, are, we were planning to do. And that will generate an enormous amount of data. Which is why it's taken so long to actually even talk about it. because it's. Uh, it's a massive undertaking just to analyze it. Um, <clears throat> so let me just go through uh, a few things uh, that we found in that. Uh, one of the things to, is to just try to make an evaluation using standard tools, and this is the S SF36 for these patients. Uh, how do they how do they r r r rank in other for other diseases? And we just compared them to a number of diseases here, and and putting on different uh, 
disabilities and where the patients are we in here. These patients are more severe than almost any of these other diseases. And I think that needs to be focused on for NIH to make them realize this is not being a little tired. Now, the, so the other thing that we decided to do in this project is to uh, test some of the ideas that patients have had. Are they right or not? So I've heard a lot from patients that, oh, I keep getting viral infections. Uh, I get them all the time. It's really my real problem. I'm very susceptible to viral infections. And, and I ask them, you know, what virus do you think you're getting? Oh, I'm, I'm sure it's HHV7 or it's another herpes virus. That's what, you know, and that's what caused my illness in the first place. So we decided to actually test uh, uh, this. And uh, we had to develop a technology to really do it and to do it what I thought was correct. And that we decided to test this list of viruses. These are all DNA viruses. These are viruses that many of the patients say they think they have. And what, what you do is a, what's called a PCR assay, a polymerase chain reaction, because it's extremely sensitive. And what you assay is, uh, is cell-free DNA that's found in the blood. Now, uh, Ron Tompkins, who I work with, he, he always refers to uh, the blood as the sewer of the body. It's also the nutrient carrier, but it also carries away all the waste products uh, that's not needed. So it's been found that if you have an infection anywhere in the body, brain, heart, anywhere in the body, some of those organisms will die, being attacked by the immune system, and DNA will get into the blood from that organism. So there have been a small startup company that's been looking at that, and they always find DNA from an infecting organism in the blood. So people say you don't want to look in the blood because what if it's not there? Organism may not be there, but their DNA will be. And so you can do a very, very sensitive test. But we didn't want to do single, like a single test, because maybe we get a false positive or false negative. So we decided to test multiple regions of these viruses, and these are the number of regions that we're testing, multiple regions of each of these viruses. Now that's an awful lot of tests, and that's going to make it expensive. So what we decided to do is, is to rig it so that we can do all of those simultaneously in one tube. So this is what we call a multiplexed uh, assay, which we're actually quite good at. Uh, and we've actually made several of these types of tests uh, commercial um, and for commercial diagnostics. Uh, and the results of that is basically there aren't virus infections that are different from healthy controls. A few people do have them, but healthy controls have more <laughs> from this small study. So it makes me suspicious that, in fact, they don't have viral infections. They have something else going on that feels like a virus infection. And a lot of inflammation things will make you feel like that. Most of these viruses probably, by themselves, don't really do anything by themselves. It's not, in their, it's not to their advantage to give a signal to the body that they're there. The body is the one that does the signaling that there's something wrong. And I think if you have that signal, like inflammation, it may feel like a viral infection. And the only reason I'm, I'm stressing that point is that if it's most likely you don't have a viral infection, you shouldn't be taking antivirals, probably, because they're probably not that healthy for you. And the reason they're probably not that healthy is that the antivirals generally target the synthesis of the DNA from the virus. And, that's, uh, and it works because the it's, a, the, the, it's a, a very primitive DNA polymerase. And, and in fact, you can inhibit it without inhibiting your human polymerase. The problem is the mitochondrial polymerase is also a primitive one. And some of these may actually inhibit the mitochondrial polymerase to some extent. And given the fact that there's some, there seems to be mitochondrial uh, lack of activity, that's probably not a good thing to do if you don't need it. So I don't think patients should be taking anything that they don't really need to take. It's probably not a good thing to do. Now, um, uh, this just tests us for the, uh, for the DNA viruses. Uh, we also have to test other things. And I'll show you uh, 
a couple of things, and that is that um, when we had, we, we, we took, and I'm not showing you the data, we've done gene expression, a, a fair amount of that, and when we, uh, uh, what Winzong has done is taken the gene expression from the patients and compared it to every other gene expression that's ever been done. And there's a collection of that, and I think that was, uh, I think he did, uh, maybe, it's, uh, yeah, 95,000 other studies, and ask for the best match. Reason to do that is that it might give us a clue as to what may be going on. And the best match, or close to the best match, is a trypanosome infection. That's sleeping sickness found in Africa. How many people go to Africa regularly? <laughs> Doesn't seem likely that it's a trypanosome. But anyway, I looked up the symptoms of a trypanosome infection and was shocked to find out they look identical to chronic fatigue syndrome. And they call it sleeping sickness because the, like, because the sleep-wake sleep cycle is inverted where the people uh, are awake all night and sleep during the day. And that's true for a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome patients. So I come up with uh, two possible conclusions from that. And one is that this disease is actually caused by a trypanosome. You would never necessarily know that. The doctors would never figure it out because the diagnostic for, for trypanosome infection is to find it in the blood. And it turns out, if you look at the West African trypanosome, and I was in Africa in 80, 86 looking at the AIDS epidemic there in, uh, in 1983, and uh, I met a lot of doctors then, and so I called them up to talk to them about this, and they said it's very easy to identify the trypanosome in West Africa because it's very abundant in the blood. But the East African one is very hard. It's, you, you, you do well if you find one. Otherwise, you treat it anyway because that's probably what it is. <laughs> so it could happen that we could have a trypanosome in the rest of the world that was very, very low level. Uh, it didn't kill you, which sleeping sickness does. And they don't spot it in the blood because it's rare. That is a real possibility. Um, the other possibility is that the trypanosome causes chronic fatigue syndrome with high efficiency. That's why the symptoms are identical and that's why the transcription patterns match um, because it is chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> Don't know the, I don't know that, but what, we'll, what we're doing is making probes for all the different trypanosomes. Again, multiple probes, and we, while we're at it, we're going to do all the parasites. Because they're also difficult to diagnose. And, and given the results that we've seen before, uh, the DNA from these organisms should be in the blood, and we'll look for it in the blood. The, another thing that we need to do is to try to figure out how to do the RNA viruses, and that's not, that's not going to be easy because RNA is not very stable in the blood. And we'll try to figure that out if we can make that work. Or some, in, some industrial group will do it. And that, that way we can look for an awful lot of infecting organisms. But there's other, uh, there's other possibilities, and in fact, well, maybe it's a... Uh, it's a new virus, and we've had that uh, excitement with XMRV. Uh, that's kind of discouraged people from looking for a, a new virus, uh, but it could be. So there's another way to do this. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, excuse me. Uh, and that is to um, uh, isolate uh, particles from the blood. And a particle would be a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, a parasite, uh, and you isolate the particles. A lot of DNA from human in the blood, so you, you destroy all the DNA, and then you extract the DNA from things that are left, and you sequence massively. And then you compare that sequence to everything else that's ever been done. And you allow it to be highly mismatched. If you, when you do that, you can find new viruses. Um, 
and, and we've had a collaboration for that. Uh, Ian Lipkin does that as well. We're doing exactly the same thing that he does. You can find new viruses. And uh, the person that was working on us with that has said, if we were to do that experiment in, in the early 80s when the AIDS epidemic started, it would take us about 24 to 40 hours to figure out HIV. It would be absolutely trivial. So these are very powerful methods for looking for new things. And we'll, we have done that once, and it comes up empty. And uh, it says that uh, we, there probably isn't an infective organism, and with the caveats of these things. Uh, the, uh, and it's possible that there's a parasite, but it's not in the blood. Another thing that the patients have told me is that they have heavy metal contamination and that they need to detox from their heavy metals. And it's making them sick. And the environment is, uh, is exposing them to heavy metals. So uh, we've done urine analysis on all the severe patients. They do not have any heavy metals. Uh, however, what a lot of them have is they're low in essential metals. And uh, we have a hypothesis of why that's true. Uh, of course, it could be because they are detoxing all the time and they're removing the metals that are essential. <laughs> and what I mean by essential metals are metals that are, are very important for your body to function. And, and uh, things that like copper, a lot of people think copper is toxic. It's, it, it's not. It's essential. <laughs> if you have too much of it, it's a problem. Very few people have too much. In the United States, about 60% of the population is deficient in copper. Very few people have toxic, uh, copper toxicity. Uh, people uh, who have a copper bracelet used to wear them. Uh, if they were told, oh, it's toxic, you've got to get rid of the copper bracelet. The amount of copper you get from your copper bracelet is about your daily requirement. Which is that when, by taking it off, you now become copper deficient. <laughs> But so, so uh, the, those patients didn't show us anything. And the problem with that, it was a urine analysis. Um, and the way that that was done, uh, they don't do mercury. And mercury was one of the ones that we were the most worried about. And so uh, uh, you have to do hair analysis. And so we, did, we did, took some new patients uh, and did hair analysis on them to see about the mercury. So these are not the severe patients. And, and, you, and what we found from that is that um, uh, this is mercury, that's just a, a chemical symbol for mercury, and you can see in red there were, se there were several patients that had a little over the limit on mercury. Um, and one patient had lead toxicity. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this, if you have too much mercury, you often have too little selenium. And selenium is used for, as an antioxidant. And we have all this oxidative damage, so you probably do not want to be low in selenium. So probably the low selenium is probably worse than the mercury uh, in being high. This is not terribly high. We've talked to each of the patients that were mercury high in the mercury, and it looks like they, it's, they're all because they eat a lot of fish, and, and especially things like salmon. And it's okay to eat fish, but don't overdo it, because all these big fish have a fair amount of mercury in them. And then a little bit of surprise is, the, is this one patient from Finland who has a fair amount of uranium. That's probably environmental. Uh, I don't know where that comes from. And we don't know the medical consequences of, of, of uranium, really. <clears throat> now, uh, this is just a collection, not a whole gene expression study. I just wanted to show you that if, if it's in red, it's increased in expression, and it's blue, it's decreased. And uh, these are just looking at the immune system, and you see a lot of changes in gene expression in the immune system. So that means that there's a lot of immunology going on, and, and we're not surprised by that. But this is just the data that shows there's a lot of immunological effects uh, in these severe patients. And then you can also do cytokines. This is a 63plex. That's higher than what's been published. So there's a few new ones that have been added to this. And, we, and here are the severe patients. And what we can see in them is that they have even higher cytokines than have been seen before. And, and, and we just put the circular plot so we can put it all together. So there is a lot of immunology. That's not surprising. 
Uh, but that's a, big, that's a big component of this disease. Uh, then we want to look further in the immune system. Um, and what we'd like to do is understand what may be going on, like in an autoimmune system situation. And so what we're looking for are, are, uh, are T-cell activation. And that was found by Mark Davis in a small study. And now um, uh, the Open Medicine Foundation uh, has uh, funded that. That was part of our collaborative research center that got turned down. But now we're going forward with that T-cell activation project. And we're going to add to that uh, doing the single cell expression analysis that Maria Hansen mentioned. And, and T-cells uh, are, uh, can recognize a foreign object through this T-cell receptor. And um, once they have identified it, they can kill the foreign agent. So it, you have a whole bunch of these in your body, and they're scanning your system for something foreign. If they find something foreign, then they amplify and make very large numbers of them, and that's called the T-cell expansion. What we find in, uh, in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is that there is T-cell expansion. I'm not going to go into the details of this plot, but you can, you can see it's filled in where healthy controls are not, and Lyme's disease looks very similar, and MS looks very similar. And so there is T-cell expansion. We need to explore that more. One of the reasons why this is really important is that it's saying it's recognizing something. We've looked for a foreign agent. We haven't found it, but maybe it's still there, and we've just failed to find it. We'd like to know what it's looking, what it's seeing. Now, it also could be seeing self. So that's an autoimmune disease. Also a possibility is there's something else that's triggering the immune system to be activated. And it's not an autoimmune disease. So we'd like to try to resolve that. That'll be very important. We've also done whole genome sequencing. And uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that. All I've done here is list a few of the genes that appear to be very important that are different in, in uh, MECFS patients and healthy controls. The highest rank uh, is this gene, and it's uh, roughly 10 times, 100 times more prevalent as, a, as an alteration than in the healthy controls. But also are these genes, and these genes are uh, involved in uh, the NK cells and they're, res they're responsive for NK cell recognition. And they are different in patients versus healthy controls. So we're now going to do a big, uh, uh, both HLA and, in and CUR uh, DNA sequencing project. Uh, and these are the ones that we'll continue to explore. Uh, this is an interesting one, and it comes up first. It's a very, very large gene, and it's in the brain. And we also find uh, a, a lot of metabolic changes. A lot of people have talked about that. Uh, but you see a lot when you look at all the different small molecules in the blood. So when we take it from a broad point of view, what we see is an activation of the immune system, a lot of genetic changes, and a lot of metabolic changes. So that's what we're going to focus on, are those two. Uh, and we've also done the microbiome, and I don't think I'm going to talk about that. Uh, that's just for the record to have that as a part of the database. Uh, but I wanted to get to, because I'm running out of time, a future direction. So what we're now doing is taking the metabolites that we see and the genetics that we see, and we're combining them. And that's something called the systems biology approach. The, me the metabolites can, are affected possibly by the genetic changes. And then we're going to put it into, in the context of actually a pathway analysis. So we make the whole flow chart of all the genetics, all the genes, and all the metabolites. And that we're, what, we're, what we're now looking for is something we call a metabolic trap. And I'm just trying to introduce that concept because it's a total different new concept. Because what we think is happening here, and this is our best guess at the moment, is because of the genetics, and because of the inflammation that gets started, uh, that you can get yourself into a situation where your pathways are normally supposed to work, 
get altered because of the mutations and, and the metabolites and the enzymatic process gets trapped into a not, an, a not very functional state. And, and when I say trapped, it means there is no easy way out. So what this would predict is that you would get something would trigger it, and we think it is an infection, will, will change your metabolism to the point where it gets trapped. That would happen almost instantaneous. You would go to sleep and you would wake up with the disease. That seems to fit. And nothing you do would get you out of it that you can normally do. There will be no drugs that you could take to get you out of it. Now, to some extent, that's good news, because it means we don't have to develop new drugs. That'll take 10, 20 years. Also, the good news is, by understanding what it is, if this is all true, it will probably be very easy to fix. But it won't be something that anybody's tried. We'll have to manipulate the metabolism. But it should be very inexpensive to do it, and it should take a few days to get you out of it. So, so that's good news. So I'm, I'm telling you this simply because I'm so optimistic this is right, but it, unfortunately, you think things almost always come out wrong. So don't get too excited about it. <laughs> but just to give you an idea what researchers are trying to do here is that we're trying to figure out what's really going on and how to fix it. And this is not about doing some research to get a publication, which seems to be the case for an awful lot of disease studies. This is trying to figure out what it is and what we need for that is everybody with all their expertise to be thinking this way. And someone maybe, I hope, will come up with what's wrong. I don't think this is that complicated in the sense of something permanently wrong with your body. I, that's why I like the trap hypothesis because it just simply says you've fallen into a trap and you just don't know how to get out. But by understanding all this, we can get you out. And that's why I'm really, I'm really hoping it's right. We'll know maybe within, a, I hope, several months to a year. It'll be more complicated than I've specified here. <laughs> I know that, but uh, I, I am optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. I'm sure that's given you a real flavor for uh, research and how to do it, along with the other talks you've heard today. I'm sorry I haven't given you time to have a lot of input yourself. You can ask Ron questions now, of course, but uh, I hope you've had a day where you see there's lots of things going on, and that's only part of it. We could have doubled this conference up in time with other people that are going, and it's because of you there are so many people now getting involved in this. And thinking like Ron's and the others that you've heard today are all going to be part of something. And there's going to be some moment when even the newspapers have to take an interest in it and admit that there's something going on and there's an explanation for it we can do something about. And really, it's because we have meetings like this, and I want to thank the speakers, of course. Thank you for all those who have helped get the conference going today and made sure it's been nice for us. It's exciting. It's nice to have exciting times in science, and I think we've started to get somewhere. And Ron, thank you for your talk. A few questions now at the end. I don't want to keep you out, because getting out of London is sometimes worse than getting in. So you know, I know you need to get home. So you want to ask Ron a question. You've had a, a way of thinking about things, which is perhaps new for you. And I know there's been a lot of technical details, which is hard to take in. But I hope you're feeling the kind of excitement that's generated in a bunch of scientists and people who are sincerely interested in the problems of ME and the effects it has on lives of people. It's time has come. It's been around too long. But with this kind of work and effort, Something is going to happen, I feel sure. There have been a number of reports that surprisingly cholesterol is high in many of the ME patients. Cholesterol is going to change the viscosity of the blood. Could that actually make a difference in your impedance measurements? 
Yeah, I missed a couple of your words because of the background noise. So cholesterol is high. Oh, cholesterol. Many cholesterol. cholesterol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In spite of the fact that they're not obese. Yeah. That will change the viscosity of the blood, especially as the temperature changes from 37 to 24 degrees. Could that change the impedance measurements in your, in your instrument? So I'm uh, just curious. Yeah, the, the disease affects a lot of lipid. Uh, uh, metabolism. That, that, that's, I think, why the white cells are light. Um, uh, and, we, and, and that's why a lot of the metabolites are, 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 uh, are lipid-containing. So I don't know why that is. Uh, one thing we do see is a fair number of mutations in fat, in fat metabolism in the patients, more so than in uh, healthy controls. So there's something about that, too. Uh, if you can't metabolize the fats well, they'll accumulate. And so, and then, there, then you can get feedback systems that affect all sorts of other uh, fats as well. Uh, you will also have to shift to, to you have to get rid of them. And so you may not be able to oxidize them uh, in the mitochondria, and you then have to oxidize them in the ER. And that just will foul your whole system up. So that's, that's just speculation, but I think... It, it, uh, I think we'll see, we'll see a lot of alterations in things that involve lipids. I was just wondering whether basically a control group could be a number of healthy people with high cholesterol to sort of mimic what we're seeing in ME patients, in which case your measurement your measure no, my, uh, uh, People high in cholesterol will probably be uh, genetically determined, and uh, it's probably very narrow in terms of the, uh, the, the lipid problems that they have. Uh, I think this is very general. There's something about uh, metabolizing fat uh, that I, and I don't necessarily understand it. It looks like also that we see a fair amount of the glucose uh, being shunted over to the sorbitol pathway, which then goes to fructose and then goes to fatty acid synthesis. So your body's even making fat. And so uh, it, 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 I, it, I don't understand it at the moment. But there's something about lipids that is re really uh, off in the patients. Mandy? Oh, it was great. Oh. Uh, I, I had two, two thoughts that uh, came to mind. One was um, your observation of improvement under fever conditions. Yes. And um, it, it turns out that there are, um, both with fever itself, but usually in association with the pyrogenic mm -hmm. stimulus, will, which could be bacterial, um, is uh, a, an inducer of CRH and, and then of ACTH. And, this phenomenon of improvement under fever conditions is also something that has been observed in uh, individuals with autism who don't speak, um, and then yeah. during a fever yeah. episode they do speak. So, that was so, so it might be, could be something with the HPA axis, and there's actually a clipped form of ACT, uh, ACTH that had been used years ago in autism that um, had led to some improvements, but then it went off patent, and I yeah. never saw anything about it again. Well, something to think about. Yeah. But, um, the other thought was about the, I thought that the uh, red cell deformability and the velocity, that even though you had some variability there, I thought that that is potentially an interesting phenomenon. I, you know, of course, I happen to be doing work right now on sickle cell yes. anemia and neuro, neuroimmune and stroke risk in that population. But one of the things that uh, happens with sickle cells that, you know, there are certain processes that um, are oxygen dependent and some that are that are not so the deformability can be both as oxygen dependent and independent depending on what level of uh, plasma oxygen tension and so the question is in your system do you control for oxygen tension or can you control for oxygen tension it might uh, first of all reduce the variability and maybe allow you to see what the group specific differences might be no, those are those are great suggestions uh, and uh, in fact, there's quite a few of them there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and one is that uh, I think there's a close relationship between autism, uh, the lack of speaking. Uh, uh, the metabolites look very similar. Uh, there's obviously a difference in onset time. Uh, and some of the differences you see in autism may just simply be because it starts at a very young age and it's affecting mental development and things of that type. Uh, uh, but one of the optimum thing, uh, optimistic things you can also see is that Bob Navio has treated uh, some autistic children with ceramon, uh, which blocks the pyrogenic receptor, and he, he got a great deal of improvement in them. And I have been trying my darndest to get a hold of ceramon. I can't. And uh, it's a big, long story. And, uh, but it will be available 
Uh, it just has to, a new manufacturing plant is now being set up in the U.S. And, uh, but it may be available by the end of the year. So that's an, that's an optimism. That, and the nice thing about that drug, it's not very toxic. Also, the curious thing, it's used for trypanosomes. That's what it was originally developed for. I don't understand that connection. One last question, please. Yeah. Following the results of the, of the drugs on the impedance device, have you any plans to trial those drugs on patients? Uh, what we're trying are drugs that are approved, FDA approved. Um, and uh, we're not physicians, so we can't. But we can do that with partnership with other physicians. And uh, that would be something I would be talking to Ron Tompkins about. Uh, we'll look at them. Uh, we did find one drug uh, that seems to improve the uh, uh, ATP production. Uh, and that's a, a drug called Ativan. And, uh, and I know that it helps because we've given it to my son. And it really, really helps him. But it's unfortunately, it's only for a few hours. And you habituate to it, so it's not a, it's used for crisis management. So we give him Ativan if we have to take him to the hospital. And he tolerates that so much better if, if, we, if he's on that drug. I don't know if it, uh, there's, a, there's a, it's a GABA, there's GABA receptors on, uh, on the white cells. And we've looked at the T cell energy production is much higher. Can I just bring it to an end by asking you, how many people feel that we're moving forward in a very positive, determined way? Or how many think we're just messing around? How many think we're moving forward in a positive way? Yes, but That's he right. does need more money, doesn't he? So he can... Well, that we'll, we'll know how to get money, you know. You, you know. Well, I, I, we'll get it. We'll get it, you know, we'll get it. So, so... Uh, probably money, money. Uh, okay. and, the, and the reason for that is that what we really need are more people yeah. but to get more people you need money yeah. and one of the problems with donations is the fact that you, you, you you're, if you want to use it 70% of the cost of doing research is, is salaries and what you want to do is get really really good people and retain them and you have a hard time retaining people if they feel that you're going to run out of money because we're headhunted all the time and I, I lose people uh, because I don't, they don't feel I, have, I, ha, I will have the money to pay their salary. And, and I just lost two fantastic people uh, because they got really, really good job offers. And they were willing to stay, but I didn't have the money at that time uh, to guarantee them a salary for the next year. And so uh, it's hard to find good people. And what you want to know, what you really want is having t t uh, uh, two years out that you have money for two years. That will keep people. If you're going to run out in six months, people will jump ship. So that, that's a, a, something in people need to understand because an awful lot of research is done by donation, unfortunately. No, it's uh, right, obviously, but, it, but it's more than just money sometimes as well. You know, you need money, but you need to get the right people who are enthusiastic and keen and talented. And, uh, you know, you need, you need, it's all right saying like the National Health Service needs more money, but it's what it's used for. It's no use just taking it and paying for all the debts you've accrued over the last 10 years. It's got to be real money that you can really invest in some new, new technologies, new people, new education programs and so on. And getting the public like you to get involved and to be able to contribute to what happens. And that's what happens here. You have ideas about what might go on because if somebody's out of order and got it wrong, you'll tell them, you know. Now, a lot of people don't like that. There's a professional sort of etiquette where some people think they know best. No, they don't. They've got to take the public with them. The public are the biggest political animals in the world. They know what's needed. They know what they want. They see it, and they've got to be listened to. And the real trouble today is they're not being listened to. That's, that's the thing. So it's not just money. It's getting them involved in it, too, to help, you know. And the money, I think, will follow. Remember when we couldn't do proton therapy for cancer, brain cancers, and a young man was taken by his mum and dad to Spain and got treatment there. And suddenly, £70 million appeared the next day. I remember fighting for that, for a proton therapy, the best method for brain cancer, and being told, you can bugger off, there's no money, you're not going to get it. And that was a time when we were doubling the bloody budget, you know. 
So, I mean, it appeared because there were pressure, different types of pressure. So there's going to be a political build-up from the grassroots up as well to make sure that the people at the top who've got the money, and there is a lot of it about, are listening. And if you look, watch every week, money appears for all sorts of things because there's agitation around it. I know it's, there's a limit. I mean, it's not unlimited. But at the same time, they find it when they need it, you know. And I'm not going to talk about defence and bombs and all that stuff. That's the political message, and it gets a bit boring sometimes. But you know what I mean. They can find money for certain things when they need it. We have got to have the voice and make sure that we're doing it. I don't think we do enough in the press, actually. I, don't, I think it's very difficult to get... I mean, sometimes it's an advantage not to have the press, but they still don't believe in ME, a lot of the journalists, the health journalists in this country. They just, they've, they've taken the, the, the message that it doesn't exist from the professionals in the, in the medical profession. And that's what we've got to fight. And that's for you guys, too, to get involved in. Because they found 60 million brain cancer just like that. Yeah. And, you know, obviously what happened to Tessa Jar was a pretty awful tragedy. Yes. But just like that, the mission yeah. of speech... Oh, absolutely. They found 60 million for brain cancer. Yeah, but that's because people have agitated for it. Certain types of people have agitated for it within the system. It's the same with prostate cancer. Money suddenly appeared for that because the poor boys suddenly started admitting that they got cancer as well. Funny how the money suddenly appeared, you know. So there's all sorts of difficult political decisions have to be made too. But you're a major part of that. So get talking, get writing, get angry, you know, and make sure that the kind of work we're hearing today and the speculations are, are really going to turn out to improve life for people. And, <laughs>